Welcome to the Soul Path Sessions podcast with Deborah Mines Pearson and Brenda Littleton. Brenda is an educator and counselor rooted in Jungian and eco psychology. She helps her clients understand the importance of the mind, body, spirit, and earth relationship for healing. Deborah is a licensed psychotherapist and has been trained in traditional and sacred psychology, exploring from the ground up what makes our human experience meaningful, wholesome, and enlightening. Deborah and Brenda invite you to accompany them on a soul path journey as they explore the possibilities of living a more soulful life as therapists, seekers, and lovers of fate. Welcome to Soul Path Sessions. I'm Deborah Mines Pearson. I'm here today with Brenda Littleton, and we're going to be talking about the inner work of aging, role to soul. I'm going to hand it to you, Brenda. Thank you, Deborah. I love the idea of talking about role to soul in the sense of aging, the inner work of aging, and which is um, a the title of Connie Zewig's new book, Inner Work of Age, Shifting from uh, Role to Soul. It is from a depth psychological perspective of looking at the advantages of aging as well as identifying uh, the resistances in and she very easily points out the different categories of resistances that if we avoid and um, ignore and repress these certain stages of life that we actually do ourselves a disservice in not fully coming into our soul's purpose. It reminds me, um, in one of our earlier podcasts, I mentioned James Hillman's work on the threshold of reaching 60 and um, briefly reiterating his mandate, his, his position that when the ego reaches the threshold of 60 so this means maybe 58 59 to 63s the ego actually gets to the point of understanding and accepting that the way one has been the way it's performed over and over again basically gives you the same reaction the same end result the same affect and if one is not happy with that there's nothing more that the ego is going to try. It's already tried everything and it's done it really, really well. So the ego says, I'm going to start stepping back. I'm going to uh, take more of a a pause. And in some way, I liken this to the tide going out and exposing more real estate. Mm -hmm. And then soul says, well, ego, the conscious world, ego is actually giving me some space to take up to fall in to mm-hmm. to roll in to soul in and when the soul flows in <clears throat> unlike ego which is very efficient of negotiating its way and putting up with certain conditions that may not be absolute the best for life and healthy the soul says no 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 we're we're not going to adjudicate or negotiate we're going to be true to ourselves and that's where we have as Connie as I would, um, actually reiterates that we have a second um, coming home we have a second midlife crisis only now instead of relying on ego to be more forceful to be more forthright to be more focused soul comes in and um, in many ways it's an avalanche yeah, I mean, I, piggybacking off that, I think a lot of times what brings us into that crisis um, or that opportunity is loss. Mm-hmm. And it can be physical loss. It can be the loss of loved ones. It can be um, facing something that is like the ocean, greater than ourselves. And we had this illusion um, that our beauty, to quote Ursula Le Guin, our beauty doesn't come just with our hormones anymore. Mm. It comes from, like it does to a young person, it comes from the person we need to be to face loss. And that sweeps us away. It's such an overwhelming feeling, just one phone call away from having our life changed mm. forever. So I think these initiations can be brutal and inevitable. And I don't think we talk about them enough. You know, 
Well, I think most of us, most of our midlife, well, since being a kid, uh, our Western civilization is about avoiding pain and making it better and fixing it, as opposed to really sitting with something so overwhelmingly painful and getting Mm -hmm. comfortable with the uncomfortable. So as you've mentioned, when we reach a point of age, a maturity, loss is what's going to be um, the crack in the cosmic egg. And instead of the light coming in, as I like to say, it's our opportunity for our light to seep out. Yeah. I love that um, there would be some form of ritual Mm. that honors that. I know, I mean, in our culture, we do have funerals, but we don't really have, we have for people, our loved ones, and those are really important, but we don't always have funerals for ourselves. And I know one of my best teachers, Bonfu Somme, a wonderful um, shaman from um, the Dagara tribe of West Africa, came into my life when I was quite young, and she taught us how the old and the young are connected. Mm-hmm. And when we are getting older, we're, we're heading back into the mystery, and the young are just coming from the mystery. So we're like children. And in this journey back into the Tao or to the unknown, the mystery, we're going to have times where we're going to feel like we're falling out of grace, and that's one of her books, Falling Out of Grace. And she taught us how to do grief rituals. She, she taught us how to gather and all of us with the express intention of honoring our grief. And it wasn't just thought or I'll keep you in my thoughts and prayers. It was like a bowl of dirt. And we put our face in it. In her village, you just put your face in the dirt. But just you put your, your face in the dirt and you cry. And you cry as long, and there's someone that's holding you. So you make mud? You make mud from your tears. Yeah. yeah. It makes it extremely real. Well, someone is, you have two attendants that are just with you, just holding that space where you lean forward and you cry into the earth and you come up with a, a face full of dirt and someone very tenderly mm. wipes your tears and your dirt. And it, so your face is is held like a child. And then from that place, you pick up a sword. This is very fierce. We actually had an Excalibur, <laughs> which is quite cool. And you strike a pose and you cut your ties with who you've been. Mm, it's, I, it's, a cord cutting ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had one of those in Idlewild, yeah. It's very muscular. Yeah. And then once you've done that and you've had the courage to walk across the, thresh- the threshold into the mystery, you're then escorted to a place where there's water. And you're bathed. In my case, it was this fountain I had in my front yard. I've actually gone in my pool doing this. And then you're wrapped in a sheet. Mm. Like a shroud? Uh Uh-huh. And you're held, or baby. You're coddled, like, you know, that innocent baby or the shroud. They're very similar, aren't they? Yeah. And you're, you're held that way. And once you've done this ritual, it's so powerful because there's this innocence of knowing you don't know and you just were honest. And it's a very innocent place like the seed. I, I'm here in my essential form and I don't know what I'll become, but I know what I can no longer be. So you're doing this not alone. You're doing this in, you're being seen and watched and heard and held by another human being. Yeah, usually it's a group of women okay. who, that I performed it with. And so just the simple act of, of being allowed to cry and not stopped and walk through it is so important. So when we say people, my thoughts and prayers are with you, that is important. But there also needs, a pl- for me, a place to be physically connected to grief and loss. Yeah, and not fix it. I'm mm-hmm. so tired and done with this whole attitude of if I just rearrange my thoughts and I'll be in a better place. And um, without the somatic work of really honoring the pain and the grief and going through the, just as you go through the actions to mm-hmm. put on clothes and shoes, you go through the actions to deal with grief and pain and sorrow. 
Yeah, and they and they don't have a timetable really. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a grief counselor, I know from hospice, they say when you lose someone you love, it's eighteen to thirty six months to put it in perspective, mm-hmm. not to get over it, but to put your loss somehow to, to remap your life. Um, so this inner work is the inevitability that what you love will be taken from you. Some of us get our initiations very young, but if you live long enough, you're going to get old, quoting my great-grandmother, and you're most definitely going to lose mm-hmm. your best friend, your parents, brother, sister. I used to say, well, I mean, perhaps I still say, but not so frequently that I'm defined by death. I was, um, my life changed when my brother died at age three, when I was three. And he was a younger brother. And then it just started the whole the whole thing of death. And, and every time a death happened, there was a major physical change in the world. And um, and I, re- I remember speaking to your point of, of grief and the amount of time my mother had died when I was 28. And she actually told me since I was age four or five that she was going to die before the age of 50 and she died yeah she died at 48 I was 28 years old and took me 18 months to after her death to become I was before I was able to even think of her death and then I immediately within two months I started therapy my first therapy Mm. yeah and Jungian work yeah invitation yes to dissolve in a loving space yeah Oh, yeah, yeah but it was the death. Yeah, yes. you know, it's again, it's the death yeah. that allowed this birth. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about the inner work of soul, I mean, those people listening who are grieving right now know exactly what we're talking about. You can't go back to who you've been. You are forever changed. Yeah. And who do you want to be? And sometimes you don't know. I mean, there is a place for not knowing, for a while, not not knowing for a while. And that's okay. So my, my question to myself that I've never really shared before was or is, are we always remembering? Mm. You know, even in that confusion, even in that space of feeling a collapse, even that space of what's what's the use? Like, why? Mm-hmm. You know, is is that not also part of the remembering of of being oneself? We allowing that sense of moving from role from Mm -hmm. the egoic uh conscious i have to survive this is Mm -hmm. what i'm good at this is my my beliefs desires dreams and longings to moving into the more mature 60 plus of who am i really you know that sense of of remembering yeah I, i love that i think on our adolescence show we talked about the inner adolescent is curious and seeks new life and i do think that's one of the opportunities i mean i was listening to a show this morning on this american life podcast about a recent shooting terrible classroom shooting and a couple who go out and they do nothing they're retired and they do nothing but just be present to hold people to talk to people to listen to people um, this gives their life meaning. Even if you head out uh, and you don't quite know where you're going, there'll be a sense of wanting for a lot of us to want to heal ourselves through connecting in meaningful ways. And that's so important to the conversation is to be able to heal in a meaningful way and come back into life crippled. So meaningful ways such as finding that latent quiet polite part of ourselves that we've kind of left to the side that we invite back in or i don't know sometimes it just comes out like i it, it, for a truly grief stricken person to be around other people who get it the other initiated mm-hmm. is really important yeah and um for those of us who are going through just you know getting older and not being able to do cartwheels anymore um or wanting to do the same kind of work we were doing I think it's really good to engage in a creative process, Mm -hmm. uh, to really formalize, think about, create place on a page to to what really matters to me, what are my core values. I mean, maybe you can't answer it right away. Um, One of my heroes in life is Beatrice Wood, who was a potter, 
um, lived up in Ojai. She lived to be 105, and I had the good fortune to meet her. Lots of young lovers. Lots of young lovers and chocolates, young men. Um, but what really made her sing in my ear was when she said, when I wake up in the morning, I, she, I think she was interviewed when she was 100, um, and she said, I see an old man in the mirror, and I put lipstick on that man and I put she had these great big Indian earrings from yeah. you know from India and her sari and she braid her long gray braid and then she'd put on her shoes and she'd go down to the kiln and she was a potter and she did these marvelous glazes and she couldn't wait. The little girl in her was just strong. And she came into this in her like her sixties. So she didn't really find her passion until much later in life and she did some sort of profane pottery too and when I had a chance to speak to her and she's she's on YouTube if you want to see this marvelous Beatrice Wood who wrote the book sometimes I shock myself in (laughs) Ojai California in Ojai California um she talks about the four C's of getting older and one is to remain curious uh to be compassionate to yourself and others and what they're going through um, to to be uh, comedic, she one of her great lines is, "I broke the bowl of my heart and laughter fell out." Oh, that's beautiful. And she lost friends and lovers. And you live to be a hundred and something. You're gonna most people, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then to stay connected to life. And so sometimes we go out there like a a blind beggar. You know, we we just go out and try different things. We have we we experiment with what brings us back to life and for me that experimentation <clears throat> always is situated in nature in mm-hmm. even if it's a, a a potted plant or um, seeds of basil that that you've given <laughs> me yeah uh, it's yeah it's it's I I was listening to my own sorrow regarding some recent shootings and just walking and listening to a podcast on um, on grief and and I was able to walk an extra mile as I was listening because I was more curious about listening to the podcast and ending my walk and had two dogs and uh, the desert dust coming up and, and I just found so much more solace and acceptance and space around me being in nature surrounded by creosote and joshua trees and uh, these these other bushes that that had these little tiny pink flowers on my point is not so much what it looked like but it was feeling this wider sense of containment like I wasn't in a little room in my bed Mm -hmm. which I can do everything in my little room and my I can write books in my bed but being out in nature and and seeing and hearing and um, being adjacent to a larger energy Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of puts things in perspective for me uh, in the sense that it's not all me and and this huge grief I have is relative to com- coming at this turning this this road and then seeing a recently fallen Joshua tree just mm-hmm. right in my way and mm-hmm. thinking well I'm just all part of it you know mm-hmm. I'm just part of it and and yes I do like the creative and and I do participate in being creative and fin- finding that sense of connection and my my true source but there is something bigger than me that's still on this planet other than some cosmos out there some favorite constellation that Mm -hmm. i go to Mm -hmm. but the nature i just find even even with the grief in nature you know like my favorite five thousand year old trees being logged on vancouver island um you know that causing a lot of pain but still the idea of uh, nature um, in dealing with my loss and grief Mm -hmm. um, well it's big enough yeah so if we think of uh moving from role to soul, we're in these roles and we're pretty well defined and I'm not against those roles. We might be uh, defined by our work or being parents um, in some way by our religion, but when that breaks open, it becomes bigger. Mm -hmm. And what can hold you when it becomes bigger? The the good earth and the big sky Mm -hmm. and the the trees. 
and digging and getting your hands. I think that it was Poisonwood Bible, Barbara King oh, Solver. King, King Solver, yeah. The image of the mother who, in the yeah. end, has lost everything, really. Yeah. But she's out gardening way into the night, you know, just... By the, the moon. By the moon. Yeah, that stayed with me. That, that I've been out uh, in the wild winds recently, but just how the necessity of grief is huge, and, and the world of humans does not make sense when it hits us. Well, I'm wondering if what you're saying is activating in me this thought that for decades our culture has been one of happiness and joy and young youth and um if it's catching up with us that now the portion of grief that we've deferred is now in full bloom because more i mean each week we're having more and more assaults on our grief factor Hmm. you know the grief pendulum is definitely swinging wildly you talked to me about this disowned when i disown um, you, you're saying when it, you disown your hatred, yeah. what happens yeah. to it? Well, I recently um, had a birthday, and I have this ritual where I go and I, I swim in a, in a very strong moving creek. It's more like a river, actually, but it puts me to test to um, get back out of the river where I got into it. And to me, it's it's ceremonial, it's sacred, it's... It allows me to see my strengths and my willingness to exert myself. And during this last week, I was I was participating in this activity, and I realized, oh my gosh! And, and I get these downloads when I'm doing this exertion. I have been dissociated, dissociating and dismissing uh, evil my entire life. That I I'm one of these people that believe everyone is good. I mm-hmm. I believe in the soul of, that the goodness of people, mm-hmm. that good people do bad things, and occasionally those bad things are horrible. Mm-hmm. But basically everyone's good, and that evil kind of died out with the Lord of the Rings and First World War, and somehow in there my naive my naivete um, was comp- I had this compensation of of just disowning. And putting whatever I believed um, was evil, uh, I just totally ignored it. And so I was basically uh, building my shadow, my own shadow work, and in the in my own, you know, my own unconscious. But that fed into the collective unconscious. And so I had this 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 complete download of realizing. I was donating and contributing my part of evil that is mine, that that I can, if I am in better relationship with, I can own it. I, I just, it doesn't own, it doesn't control me. It doesn't um, come out as evil. But if I ignore it and I relegate it away, like I'm not an evil person, I don't have any bad in me. I'm a good girl. Mm. It is. It goes into the giant fuel tank of uh, available evil for people. For from a Jungian perspective, mm-hmm. evil comes to visit. You're, you're not an evil soul per se, but it is a, similar to when schizophrenia comes to visit or anxiety comes to visit. Mm-hmm. We host these these sensations, these archetypes. So evil will come to visit, but not in my life. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I was like, Mm-mm. I and I I gave it away. So in, and I, I was thinking of the current war uh, when I was looking at the f- fields that would normally be planted by now mm-hmm. are, are completely littered with bombs and yeah. tanks and there's, mm-hmm. there's no food growing. People are going to starve. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, re- I was working on the, the form of how, how does evil being visited upon our lands these days? Yeah. Yeah. And there's... I, and I saw my direct relationship with participating by denying. Hmm. And I was on a conference this, this morning with uh, some depth psychologists and saying our work is about bringing into the conversation our own shadow work and saying, yes, I am that. I, can, I could kill for that. Mm-hmm. Yes, I am the shooter. And, and really, really owning the fact that it is possible. 
It's like that Thich Nhat Hanh poem where he says, I am everything. I am yeah. the fish, I am the worm, I am the girl who's been raped, I am the rapist. It's, it's being able to see that part of us. It may not come out like shooting someone, but we've thought about it. Yeah. And I think, you know, Anne Ness, is Anne Ness, Sarah Ness, a young woman who talks about the art of difficult conversations, she says, mm-hmm. when you're carrying that energy where you're really pissed off and you're, you're, you're feeling pretty hateful towards the other, you're not listening. Mm-hmm. I've been that person, and, and I've felt those violent thoughts towards them, and they maybe felt them towards me. And the simple art of owning that and saying, I am being very evil, violent in my thoughts. I'm completely closed off. I, I wish your demise. I mean, it's, it's just... It's natural and it's normal. But once we can say that as humans, it's something we do, like eating and going to the bathroom. We have parts of us that go very, very dark. Yeah. And we don't care about other people's suffering. And we can walk right by it. And that's a normal thing. Like prejudice is a normal thing. It, but if you don't talk about it, it turns into something we deny, but it continues. Yeah. And it will continue as long as we deny it. Right. And I do think the very old person, I know Clarissa Pinkola Estes talks about this in The Power of Crone, knows that. You know, mm-hmm. you'll see in a, sometimes in the very old, that sort of innocent glimmer, this experienced glimmer of knowing in any group that people aren't telling the truth. Because mm-hmm. that's just the way they are. They're putting on their persona. And they'll say something like, well, it isn't always necessarily like that, you know, <laughs> the way you're saying it, that you're such a good person. You know? And especially the, the, the conversation I've been hearing lately, was, oh, well, there's, you know, there's, there's always the other side of gun laws. You know, there's always, there's always, the, uh, well, let's look at the other side. And I go, well, tell me the other side of killing 18 children, 19 children and two teachers. And mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So in many you know, it does sound judgmental, this form of discernment. Um, but I do believe as long as we continue in a culture of being polite and not saying what is real, um, because we don't have the skill set, we don't practice the skills of holding those tensions of opposites. Yeah. We take it personally, as opposed to critical thinking, where we listen to the po- the three main points of a conversation and yeah. look at data as support to say, as an example, this is why I'm trying to show this to you so that you can see the bigger picture. Yeah. We um, close down and personalize it and become so defensive that there's just absolutely no way in, hence mm-hmm. no way out. Yeah. And so often, it really is the, what's the most logical step to take? Like semi-automatic weapons, you know, really looking at what we can possibly have a conversation. Are they really necessary for, you know, civilians to have? Yeah. Um, but, but like Sarah Ness talks about, trying to arm wrestle somebody mm. who's not listening, uh, to me, is a form of extreme ignorance. I'd rather take quiet action. Mm-hmm. Um, not quite necessarily not having a conversation, but I don't want to waste my time with somebody who doesn't want to hear what I have to say. Yeah. Choosing, it, it's the idea of eliminating um, based on fruition. Um, and it's also the lack of, I'm not as afraid as I get older. Yeah. I mean, I've got, you know, who knows? You know, I, I mean, I'm not going to add 40 years to my age and still be here, I don't think, unless I'm like Beatrice Wood. Um, but this idea, I think, from going from role to soul, my soul says, oh, what's the best way to to really create change? And I'm old enough to know that it's probably not yelling at people who don't agree with me. Right. It's, it's to understand how laws are made. It's to understand who you talk to, the letters you write. I've written quite a few in my day. Um, where I can have influence, I do. And that's, I'm less afraid to take that action. Mm-hmm. And I'm also less afraid to take action in the idea of looking at the whole system as to why the affect is so, um, why, why the, our behaviors and actions as a, as a culture create so much loss, stress, and grief. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's, it is avoidable. 
mm-hmm. but it, it's it's based. I mean, in so many ways, I see the f- the the focus and the goal of um, not creating difficult situations to be comfortable with ends up creating difficult situations that we have to learn how to be comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Like we end up getting what we try to avoid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know some of us are meant to stand on a stage and speak to a lot of people, and some of us are just made to pay attention um, to what's happening mm-hmm. on a small scale. Mm-hmm. And so often in my work as a healer, um, I deal with you know broken kids um, at the most basic level before they become them. <laughs> They're one of us. And sometimes... Uh, it's just being willing to be tuned in to somebody's disenfranchisement, uh, mm-hmm. to be a presence in their life, to be a mentor, to be a big brother or sister. Is, it may be, it, it's like Carolyn May says, maybe my role is to make soup on Adam Street. Mm-hmm. Maybe it isn't, when I go from role to soul, I may quiet down my feverish, mind and just see what's happening in the room I'm where I am and there have been many times where I've just seen someone's suffering someone's left out mm-hmm. uh, someone needs some cooling off time I don't want to run past them because I'm on my mission so so these kinds of events in addition to being horrible have the capacity to make me look at moments with people as opportunities to love them and ourselves too. and ourselves yeah yeah we connect the idea of looking at the projection of looking towards others uh, from my experience has also been as i'm working and working and working and and serving others as a as a as a therapist and counselor and coach, I realize, oh, that's really me that I'm wanting. That's, that's the work that I'm doing for them <laughs> that I need to do for myself. <laughs> and so it's, it's um, it, it really, you know, when I was starting to deal with my, okay, come on, like, like let me get, let me get close to the shadow stuff. I, I also remembered this, this four steps of me, doing the work for me um, as well as working for others but looking at my creating an intention um, and then once I have that idea of the the new pattern I want or the it's not so much fighting the old and getting rid of the old pattern but working toward new neural transmitters neural pathways for myself in new ways Mm -hmm. setting the intention thinking different Mm -hmm. thinking different and then paying attention to it like giving Mm -hmm. myself making sure that I pay attention to the intention Mm -hmm. and then I get to this these places that are very familiar these boundaries that I think nah I don't really want to go beyond this boundary Mm -hmm. and it's like no you have to exert yourself so extending extension yeah yeah making sure that I I know it's uncomfortable I'm going to try it even if it's just for a minute Mm-hmm. And then I'm going <laughs> to create this new watermark. So extending my comfort zone. And then afterwards, integrating all of those those other three into, oh, who am I now? Mm-hmm. Like, how is this different? Mm-hmm. Who am I? Oh, yeah, this is what it feels like. This is, what I, this is who I am. This sounds, that's right. That becomes... It becomes your way of expressing, becomes your new sort of identity, mm-hmm. and it's much more soulful. Yeah. So I'd like to explore in our next, um, in our next uh, podcast, just this whole idea of like this integration. Great. I'll meet you there. All right. And that concludes this week's episode of the Soul Path Sessions podcast with Deborah Mites Pearson and Brenda Littleton. If you'd like to hear more about living a more soulful life, please subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast app, and be sure to check out the show notes and links below. For more information from Deborah, 
visit soulpathsessions.com. And for Brenda, brendalittleton.com. Thank you for listening, and remember to follow your soul. It knows the way.